This episode of the Memory Palace is brought to you by Article. We are big fans of Article here at the Memory Palace. This room of the palace, um, the ballroom where I'm sitting right now, um, it's palatial, trust me, um, is lit beautifully uh, by a legit beautiful lamp from Article. This stuff is of extraordinarily high quality. Um, it is truly lovely furniture that's influenced by you know mid-century modern and Scandinavian styles. Um, I have a feeling you're really going to like it. If you've never checked it out before, you know, summer and warmer weather is right around the corner here in the Northern Hemisphere. And they really have fantastic outdoor furniture. It's totally worth checking out. Go to article.com and take a look. The stuff looks great and it is made with all these outdoor friendly materials like teak and acacia wood and granite and galvanized steel and rattan. And it comes to you with a flat delivery fee of $49, regardless of what you're buying and how big the order is. So go to www.article.com slash memory palace and get $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. That is www.article.com slash memory palace. Go check it out. I'm excited to tell you guys about a new sponsor that solves the underlying problem of furniture shopping, which is you look at the stuff online and you have no idea whether it's going to actually work in your room. Well, say hello to Modsy. With Modsy, you can see new furniture in a 3D model of your actual room and redecorate it until you get your room just right. You're going to send Modsy a few photos of the room, going to answer a short online style quiz, and that's it. Then you have this sort of 3D model of your room, and then you can take furniture that they have from all these great partners, like Crate and Barrel and West Elm, and spin them around, and you can see exactly how they're going to look in your space. And there's no more, you know, crossing your fingers and just hoping it's going to fit, or crossing your fingers and just hoping that the colors aren't going to clash. You can swap stuff out until you find just the right thing you're looking for. So head over to modsy.com slash memory and you can get yourself a 20% discount on your first room. That's M-O-D-S-Y dot com slash memory. This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. Elevators are old. They would have to be. Because it is in our nature, right? To rise. So history, even ancient history, is thick with things that lift other things. Ropes and platforms and weights and pulleys. With people to pull them. When the slaves of Rome were served up to the wild beasts at the Colosseum, other slaves pushed the wheels that pulled the ropes that lifted the platforms, that sent them up from the darkness below ground, up into the sun and the roar of the crowd and of the lions. In China and Hungary and Mont Saint-Michel, one can find monks and kings and courtesans and construction materials and meals fit for queens and sordid consorts rising up, while some slave or servant or caged animal somewhere pulled on some rope or pushed some piece of wood around and around and around. One man in France spent the year 1743 inside a chimney, waiting for a bell to ring so he could pull a rope through a pulley and hoist King Louis XV up in a flying chair from the ground to his bedroom balcony, rather than have him walk up a single flight of stairs. Elijah Otis was too sick for the family business. He was a good-looking kid and smart as a whip, but he was kind of a weakling. And when he was 19, he moved away from the family farm in Vermont to figure out something to do for a living, something where he wouldn't have to exert himself, sell anything bought or processed, process anything sold, bought, or processed, or lift heavy things. He wound up in a furniture factory, where he and his co-workers spent their days sanding curves and decorative knobs into bedposts. And Otis spent his nights designing a better way to do it. He invented a machine, a kind of lathe that sped up the process. It increased output, it made the men's jobs a little easier, and it opened up the aesthetic possibilities of the bedpost in new thrilling ways. Knobs upon knobs upon knobs upon knobs. And his boss was so impressed that he took him off the floor and made him head engineer of the Mays and Burns Bed Factory of Yonkers, New York. So Otis got to work trying to solve one of the biggest problems in the place. The factory had a lift. It had an elevator. A lot of factories were starting to have them then. These were simple machines. Just picture a platform that could be pulled off the ground up to a second story on a chain or a set of cables or ropes. Sometimes the ropes would be pulled by a steam power winch, 
but the one in the Mays and Burns bed factory of Yonkers, New York was pulled by a draft horse. And one day the horse is pulling on the rope, which is pulling the wooden platform loaded with lumber and tools up to the second floor. And the rope snapped. The platform plummeted, dropping 15 feet, slamming down onto the floor and onto one of the men below, sending its cargo careening, smashing into the scattering workers. Just a few years later, in 1843, Elijah Otis stood on a wooden platform, 30 feet off the ground. The elevator was loaded with lumber and tools and barrels, just like the one had been that day in Yonkers. And down below, on the floor, stood hundreds of gentlemen and ladies who didn't want to spend their night out in the town being crushed by construction equipment. They had come to the Crystal Palace exhibition to see the gathered wonders of the world. A massive structure of steel and glass had risen in Manhattan, where Bryant Park is today. It was America's first World's Fair, and New York was psyched. And the gentlemen and ladies, after walking through these sculpture gardens and the art galleries, found themselves in a great hall filled with industrial equipment. And while they stood on the floor of the main hall, moonlight streaming through the glass roof, craning their necks to see Otis and his elevator floating in air, They may not have known that they were looking at the future. Because they had seen elevators before, and seen one inventor after another come up with some new way to get from one floor to another. So here was one more. Admittedly, he was higher than they'd seen before, up three stories instead of two. But there was no way this thing was going to catch on. Because who in their right mind was going to ride a three-story elevator? Fall from the second floor? Break your leg. Fall from the third? You break your neck. So they watched Otis and watched his son nearby raise a sword and then bring it down like an executioner, slicing the rope that held up the platform. And the audience screamed. And then they cheered. Elijah Otis didn't invent the elevator. He invented the brake, the little metal piece that catches the car and stops it from plummeting if the cable that holds it up stops holding it up. Elijah Otis didn't invent the elevator, but his sons kind of invented the modern world. The Otis brothers convinced the world to aim higher. The tallest buildings back in the 19th century, the tallest buildings that weren't churches or lighthouses, which were all show-offy spires anyway, were just a few stories tall. In part, these buildings were held down by the lack of engineering know-how. But just as much, they were held down by stairs. People could only climb so many. So the brothers Otis came up with a killer sales pitch. Higher was better. They targeted hotels first and convinced them to turn the idea of luxury, quite literally, upside down. Before the elevator, the best rooms were on the bottom floor. You didn't have to walk. Stairs were for suckers. But the Otis brothers convinced hotels it should be the other way around. The first floors were the one on the street, with the hoi polloi and their noise and their sweat and their fruit carts sticking in the sun. And worse, the horses and the things horses do. Wasn't a king's throne supposed to be higher than his servants? Wasn't a lord supposed to lord over? Why shouldn't the wealthy traveler be above it all? And the hotels bit, and they built high, and the wealthy travelers liked the view. And when it came time for them to build their next office building, they built higher still, and they bought from the Otis Elevator Company. Buildings grew, three stories to four to six, and the elevators grew better and faster to the delight of passengers who loved the thrill ride of hurtling 70 feet at speeds of 600 feet per minute up to the penthouse on the seventh floor. But though the Otis safety elevator relieved them of the fear of falling to their dooms, it created a new concern. One ginned up in the papers and in the esteemed pages of the Scientific American, which warned of the horrors of something called elevator sickness, acute dizziness and nausea, owed to the specious fact that when an elevator comes to a stop, not all of your organs stop at the same time. 
the best way to combat this, it seems, was to brace your head up against the ceiling of the elevator as it came to a stop. So all of you stopped at the same time. The regional headquarters of the Otis Elevator Company in my hometown is a one-story building. I just always thought that was kind of funny. At another World's Fair in Chicago in 1870, a crowd gathered to watch a dramatic demonstration of the latest in elevator safety technology. Earlier that year, a seven-story building in New York became the tallest in the world. And it had every architect and every illustrator in the Sunday circulars drawing up visions of the cities of the future, with gleaming towers climbing, soaring 11 and even 14 stories. And though people had grown to trust the Otis break at four and five stories, what would happen if something happened and you were up there scraping the sky? So the fairgoers went out to a field where another inventor had constructed a temporary elevator shaft, this one 109 feet tall, and they watched as passengers climbed to the top and stepped inside. And they watched as someone cut the rope to the elevator, and it dropped, plummeting for a few exhilarating seconds before it came to a slow stop, cushioned by a pocket of compressed air. And then the crowd politely applauded, the outcome never having really been in doubt, what with the wonders American inventors were coming up with all the time. And really, they had seen this trick at a World's Fair before. They may have been more excited, however, had they known that this same technique had been tested in secret in Boston not long before. And when the elevator car holding eight volunteers dropped on command, the air pressure in the shaft that was supposed to cushion its descent blew out the walls of the elevator shaft, leaving nothing to stop the free-falling car but Massachusetts soil. Many bones were broken. Lives passed before eyes. All eight of them nearly died something the eight volunteers who climbed into the elevator in Chicago hadn't been told.